Then there's the tree-like structures that make us up. It stretched down to the tiniest realities, the, the microcosm. And there's this, uh, this idea, it's all represented in the same way. Again, it's this idea, especially the Mandela up in the top right, it's the idea of this perfection of crystalline structure. And that's what the yogis are trying to attain when they organize their bodies. They're trying to get every single layer of their being aligned properly. And it's something like, and you can kind of see an echo of that in the, I think that's a Tibetan sand painting, if I remember correctly, on the, on the bottom left. The idea is that if you get yourself aligned properly, then information can flow along that tree that, that's you without, without impediment, something like that. And that would be like a state of optimal health. And that both physical and spiritual exercises can put you in that state. And that's, well, those are all clouds of ideas that surround this idea of a ladder to heaven. So Jacob is talking to God and God says, Behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places where you go and bring you again into this land, for I won't leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. And Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. That's a sacrifice. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all of that that is given to me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. And that's a pretty good place to stop. So now I'll just conclude. So you have this very morally ambivalent character, right? Who's so far, pretty much everything he's done that we're familiar with is not good. So he's, he's betrayed his brother horribly twice, badly enough so that he... His brother wants to kill him, and everyone can kind of sympathize with his brother. So, and then he runs away, essentially, because his mother tells him to, which is not exactly a testament to his character. And despite that, strangely enough, he has this experience, you know, and that's heartening, I guess. And that's the point, is that people are predisposed to terrible error. There's no doubt about that. And yet... When I was writing my latest book, I had a friend of mine, Norman Deutsch, wrote the foreword. And Norman's written a couple of great books, and he's Jewish. And uh, he read some of what I'd written, and he took me to task for making the God of the Old Testament, you know, from a Christian perspective, too harsh and unforgiving. And I rewrote a fair bit of it because of his criticism and because of what I've learned doing these lectures. It's like, it's not exactly right, you know, I mean... What happens in the Old Testament is if you screw up, especially if you know you do and you decide that you're not going to do anything about it, so it's conscious and deliberate, then, like, look the hell out. You are in serious trouble. And I actually think that's also psychologically accurate. One of the things Jung pointed out, and this always struck me, was that if you don't know what you're doing, this is actually in the Gospel of Thomas as well, interestingly enough, as one of the Gnostic Gospels, Christ tells his followers something like, if you make a mistake and you don't know what you're doing, then you'll be forgiven for it. But if you make a mistake knowing what you're doing, and you do it anyways, then, like, good luck to you. And, and, and I think, that's, I think that's, that's psychologically accurate. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about the judgmental God in the Old Testament, however, is that he can be bargained with, and even if you make mistakes, especially if you're unconscious of them, if you haven't learned yet, let's say, then you always have the opportunity to return to the proper path. And that's, people get cynical about that because there's, you know, this 
mostly Christian idea that you could live a terribly sinful life, but if you repented on your deathbed, it's like heaven for you. And it's like, well, that's, that sounds like a great deal, right? It's like, <laughs> you can do whatever the hell you want until just before you die. Of course, you might not know when that is, so that's a problem. You, then you can just say, well, I'm sorry, and, you know, everything's forgiven. But the problem with being cynical about that sort of thing is that it's no trivial matter to repent. You know, because to repent means, A, to figure out what you actually did. And the worse things that you did, the more horrible it is to figure it out. It's no joke, right? And there's no genuine repentance without understanding of the depth of your depravity. And so, if you've lived a particularly reprehensible life, and you come to understand it, I think that in and of itself could kill you. You know, it's a terrible thing to wake up and see what you've done, if what you've done is truly terrible. So there's no easy out. It's not an easy out. It's, it's just pure cynicism to associate that idea with, with an easy out. It's not. But there is that positive idea that that's continually represented, is that the individual is the source of moral choice, and the individual is prone to genuine error and temptation in a believable and realistic way. But that that doesn't sever the relationship between the individual and the divine and the possibility of further growth. And then I would say, well, thank God for that, because without that, like, who would have a chance, right? Who would have a chance? And so, the idea that the deity as presented, the infinite, let's say, as presented in the Old Testament is merely judgmental, is definitely wrong, and, and is in fact something that you can contend with and bargain with. I'll, I'll close with one thing. One of the things that I learned that while I was going through this was the meaning of the name Israel, because Jacob eventually gets named Israel. And, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the, to the next lecture, but Israel, and so he's also the father of Israel and the father of the twelve sons who make up the twelve tribes of Israel. But what Israel means is he who struggles with God. And that's such an interesting idea because it's, a, again, a psychological idea. And that, that's why I said earlier that it isn't obvious in the Old Testament what it means to believe in God because what Jacob does is struggle with God. And I think that that's a really good characterization of an ethical life because if you're trying to lead an ethical life, that's what you're doing is you're, you're struggling. Like, blind belief isn't helpful because you don't know what you're believing in. Like, it's just not that helpful. But if you're possessed by, by the desire to orient yourself properly, but also confused by the, by the existential structure of the world, which we all are, then, then what you're doing when you're trying to orient yourself properly in life is struggling ethically. And, and Jacob actually gets quite hurt. He wrestles with God, literally, and God dislocates his... his his thigh. And so, you know, the idea there is watch the hell out, right? The thing that you're contending with is powerful, although you can contend with it. That's the thing that's so interesting. But, you know, you do it at some genuine peril, which I think is exactly right. But the idea that Israel, so there's Israel the state, let's say, and Israel the promised land and all of that. But there's this more important idea, which is again a psychological idea, which is the state of Israel, which is the promised land, is the state that everyone who wrestles with God exists in. And that's not happy, naive belief in, you know, uh, an eternally blessed afterlife. It's not that. It's not a wish fulfillment. It's, it's, it's to be actively engaged in life, in, in the difficulties of life, right? And trying to find the path. Because that's what wrestling with God is. It's trying to find the path. And that seems to me what belief means fundamentally in the Old Testament, perhaps in the New Testament as well, is that belief is expressed in trying to find the path. And that's an ethical struggle, and it's a real struggle. It's the struggle of life. So as long as you're willing to engage in that struggle, then, hypothetically, you have the divine behind you. And so, I believe that. I think that's true. Because the other thing I see is that the people who set things right so that the, the, the horrible forces of cosmic destruction don't do us in. The people who are trying to set things right are the ones that are struggling ethically. And so, and that, there is a redemptive element to that. And I don't think there's any way of being cynical about that. So, well, so thank you, Will.